because he is our rock, he is our strength, he is our hope, and under his shadow, the shadow of his wing, we shall abide, and that's where we're safe.
more glory. We give you more thanks this morning. Lord, you are so powerful. Hallelujah. Your love is mine. I don't deserve it, Lord, but because of your grace, I receive it. For I am not a small God. I am not a big God. I am not a God that can ever be found. I am an everlasting God and I am your God. Yes, your God. And I delight in your praise. I delight in your worship. And yet you still will take me for granted. Don't take me for granted because I am the answer to every need that you have. Don't turn to the world. Don't turn to man. But seek me first, says the Lord. But seek me first, says the Lord. For I am your way, I am your truth, I will lead and guide you with every step that you make, but keep your eyes firmly fixed on me, I hear your prayer, I hear your prayer. I know you're there, I know you're there, the door is opening, the door is opening, but there's an army that pushes against it, there's an army that pushes against it, because the end result is great, and I will bring down that army. And that door will open wide. It will swing open wide and never close again. It will never close again. Because I am the God Almighty. I am the God of all creation. I am the God of every living thing. Maybe you need healing in your bodies today. 
maybe you need healing in your minds. Maybe you need healing in your finances. Maybe you need healing in your finances. Maybe you need healing in your relationships. I am the God who healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I say my word and I heal your disease. I am the Lord.
in Jesus' name, because you are our Father, we shall not lack, we shall not want. And your word says, Lord, the final strength, the strength that fell on the back of Jesus, we ask that you heal in Jesus' mighty name. I want you first to go to Genesis chapter 13. We're going to have a look at an example of this in the Old Testament first. And then I'm going to try and bring it up to date to where we are. Because we need to know how to deal with situations that are contentious for us as born-again believers, full of the Spirit of God, and in this world today. But I first just want to give you an idea of what the Bible says about it. In Genesis chapter 13, we'll read from verse 1. It says, Then Abraham, Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and. Is that I? I. 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 Yeah, I wasn't sure it was AI. Or A -L. Verse 4, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. So he was also quite wealthy. You know, in those days, they measured a man's wealth by the cattle and the livestock and all his possessions, material possessions that he had. Much the same today. People get judged by their possessions and how they dress and the car they drive and the house. And there's nothing wrong with those things. God wants us to prosper in all things. He doesn't want us to be in lack. Psalm 23 says that the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not lack. It's a statement that if God is your shepherd, you shall not lack. And in Proverbs it also tells us that God delights in the prosperity of his saints. And we're all God's saints. Hallelujah. So it says, Lot also he went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they could dwell together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife. There was contentions between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abraham said to Lot, Please let there be no strife or no contentions between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers, we are brethren. We are brothers in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In the King James Version of the Bible, I'm reading from the New King James. I know Lee is reading from the New International Version, and some of you read the Living Translation. It doesn't matter. When we read the Bible, we read it according to the spirit of the Word, and not according to the letter of the law, because Jesus has already fulfilled the letter of the law. He said you cannot add one dot or one jot to the word, to the law of the word. And here we can see that in the authorized uh, version of the King James Version of the Bible, it doesn't use the word strife, it uses the word contentions because they mean exactly the same thing. So we can see that contention is strife. And in the world, there are many contentions. There is much strife. Yeah. Just look at Gaza today. Yeah. Just look at the Ukraine today. Yeah. And look at other places, yeah. Sudan, and other places throughout the world where there is strife. Yeah. 
A content contention and strife affects everybody. Contention and strife can make you ill, can make you sick. Contention and strife can stop you from growing, can keep you where you are. There's somebody I know who's going through a life of contention and strife. And for that person to grow spiritually and to grow into God's full potential for her life, it's going to be very difficult until that contention is being dealt with. So in the world there are many contentions and they all start with the motivation of the heart. You see, where there are wars in the world, it's usually because in the heart of one of the leaders there is a lust for power. There is a lust for power. We as a family of believers, we only know one power. Some of you will have heard me say when I stand at the door and say goodbye to you, you will have heard me say, stay strong in the Lord and the power of His might. There's only one power and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And we only lust after that power, that power of God. We sang, we sang a song today and we pray, Lord, give me more power, more power. And we pray for the Holy Spirit. When a church goes through revival, it's because the people in the church, they're experiencing more of God's oh, no, uh, uh, presence yes. and more yes. of Lord. His power yes, in Lord. Jesus' name. Yes. And how oh, we need more of God's yes, presence Lord. today. How we yes. need more of God's power. I have learned through things that I've been through. I've been learning how God is working in my life. Might be different how he's working in your life. But I've learned I have to be patient and I have to trust God with everything because God is busy working things out. And you see, when God is trying to work things out in my life, he has to work in other people's lives as well. And sometimes he has to wait on them before he can manifest whatever it is he's going to do in my life. So what do I do? I have to learn to do what the Bible says. That is, take it before the Lord, leave it at the feet of the Lord, and then step back and rest in the Lord. And where there's rest, there's no contention. Where there's rest, there is no strife whatsoever. In Proverbs chapter 13, you don't have to turn there if you want to trust me, but I'll read it to you, Proverbs chapter 13. And verse 10, it says there, By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well-advised is wisdom. The well-advised are the people that have listened to good counsel, to godly counsel, and they've, allowed, they've, they, they've rather chosen the, the, the path of God's wisdom, godly wisdom rather than pride, allowing pride. You know, pride says, I want more. Pride says, because that person's got it, I want it. Pride says, I will run this country because you don't know how to run this country and pride will kill whoever gets in the way. That's pride. That's pride. Pride wants to be the best looking person in town. Nothing wrong with being good looking, nothing wrong with putting makeup on, nothing wrong with dressing nicely, but what is your motivation? What is your motivation? Is it to be the best looking person in the church? Is it to be the best looking person in the shopping centre? Nice to do yourself up, to look presentable, of course, but don't have pride about it. You see, because without Jesus, you're nothing. That's right, amen. And pride comes amen. just before a fall. Actually, he says a Holy Spirit comes before yeah. a fall and pride before destruction. Yeah. If you've got a heart full of pride, it might take a few years, but eventually you'll destroy yourself. You need to deal with your pride. But with pride comes contention or strife. With pride there comes contention or strife. And James, he also speaks about pride. And he tells us in James chapter 3 and verse 16, he says there, For where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion 
and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then is gentle, then is willing to yield, humble, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Verse 16 said, For where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. And that's what pride brings about. Pride brings about those things into your life. It says in verse 14, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Because it's the truth that sets us free. It's the truth that sets us free. Anything else will keep us in captivity. Pride will keep you in captivity. We sang this morning, you are the God that healeth me. And I told you, if you're in lack, hold up your purse or your wallet. I said to you, if you're sick in your body, put your hand on that part where you're sick. You see, if you cannot believe that God is the healer, you're going to keep yourself in a prison for the rest of your life. You'll never really be free in Jesus' name. In Galatians chapter 5 and verses 19 and 20, it says there now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. There we are, contentions. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. And then it goes on and on. Verse 21, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are many people that went to parties last night, they got drunk, and this morning they got babalos, and instead of coming to church, they stayed in bed. Why? Because last night they were participating in revelries. And those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. God wants you to enjoy. God wants you to enjoy life. There are times when God... Uh, doesn't mind you, he wants you to go to party to enjoy yourself, but he doesn't want you to get drunk, he doesn't want you to participate in revelries, and he doesn't want you to put it in place of, or be it, let it be an obstruction to you going to church in Jesus' name. Personally, I don't like getting too involved in things like that because I don't want my mind on worldly things, I want my mind on godly things. There's a couple of worldly bands that I like. I like Alan Parsons is one of them, and uh, him in particular. And I like Santana playing the guitar and things like that. But they will never ever take the place of city worship. Right. They will never ever take the place of what's that guy called? David. Uh, uh, yes, but the other one. Josh. 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 That's it. Yes, he even trend them also. And they won't, because why? Because those songs that they sing, they bring peace into my heart, they speak into my spirit, whereas the things that Alan Parsons sings, I am the eye in the sky, what eye in the sky are you talking about? That's right, absolutely. Oh, sure. There's my parrot, contentious with the word. <laughs> spy, hello, spy. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure, that was on the plot. Yeah. 20 odd years ago. Hey, and he could swear. Ooh. Anyway, I won't tell you some of the things he said. We should seek peace, and if necessary, we, you know, we need to understand that sometimes we will disagree. And we need to learn to agree to disagree. But not let that, so that that disagreement will not lead us into rejection of one another. Because then we're in the realm of contention. So we need to learn to agree 
to disagree, but we must be humble enough that if the other person that we're in disagreement with is right, yes. we will go along and say, I'm sorry, right. you were right, yes, right. and I'm going to yes. agree with Amen. you. Corrie Ten Boom, I don't know if any of you have heard of her, I've read, read some of her books. And Corrie Ten Boom, she said, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. Mm. When you switch on the news, I don't see. like watching the news, because all you see is about hijacking, cash in transit, yeah. Yeah. murder, yeah. child abduction, yeah. child yeah. abduction, please yeah. mummies, be very careful of your children. You can trust God with your children, but there are many children. Mm. I read yesterday, I could not believe it, or the day before, that at the moment in South Africa, in South Africa, per day, there are 1,300 children reported to the police missing. That's the ones that are reported to the police. 1,300 per day! I couldn't believe it. If you look within, uh, sorry, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. Yeah. Yeah. If you look within, you might well be depressed. <laughs> and sometimes I look within and I get very depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. So let me say it so as it rhymes. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. You see, the Bible says we are in this world, but we are not right. of this world. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. I've heard many, I'm not going to say one in particular, but I've heard many discussions on the, tele, on the radio where they have had, um, where they've had a pastor on, and they've had somebody worldly on uh, who wasn't particularly a believer and the, the discussion has got into argument and got into contention and people don't understand why and the simple answer to why is found in 1 Corinthians uh, let me just see Sorry, in 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, yes. sorry, 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, and verse 14. And it says there, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now the natural man is a man who's devoid of the Spirit of God. And when he's in discussion with a man that's full of the Spirit of God, and they're doing an interview and a discussion, the man who's a natural man cannot understand. Today, we will find ourselves coming up against worldly people out there, and boom, when they come up, we can so easily get involved in argument and conflict why? Because what their reasoning is, what their position is, is a worldly one right. and not a godly one. You know, the God of this world is the love of money. That's the God of this world. Money is good. It's nice to have plenty of money. It's nice to be able to freely pay your bills without worrying about it. It's nice freely to be able to go to the shops and to buy. And uh, it's nice to be able to help others. God wants us to be blessed so that we can be a blessing to That's other right. people. But the world can be like rats sometimes. You know, I saw a picture, and it's obviously, it was probably an artist's uh, uh, um, rendering of this picture, because it was a picture of the Great Plague of London in the 1600s. And there, there was a bubonic plague plague which was spread through rats and there they showed these rats the picture showed these rats going down one of the streets in London and the street was full of these rats but these rats they were running across each other biting the rat in front of him in the neck to get out of the way so as he could go on and that's what the world is like and you see 
People do not understand when we're dealing with the world, they don't understand sometimes where we're coming from. Now you get in the church, you can get what we call carnal Christians. Christians that have been born again, but they haven't for really grown. Yes. Yeah. yeah, usually for five minutes. Yeah, yeah, but believe it or not, you can still get carnal oh, Christians yeah. in the church for a long time yeah. because they've done nothing growing. about growing. That's they right. haven't bothered to learn what the Word says. They haven't spent time building their relationship with the Lord. And therefore, they haven't spent time growing. And they remain carnal. So sometimes they don't understand when you make decisions or maybe not so much when you make decisions, when you do things or when you say things or the way you operate in life. They don't quite understand why you do it that way. Well, you need to know that as mature Christians, and when I say mature Christians, I say respectfully, because none of us reach full maturity. We're all at different levels That's of maturity. But when you're a maturing Christian, let me say, a growing Christian, you will do things the way God wants you to do. So sometimes we can get caught up with the world trying to do things our way or God's way and they don't understand and it can bring contentions in Jesus' name. Lord, just bring that to my remembrance. But even in the church today, it might be difficult to understand what God is doing. You have to be in close relationship with God to understand what he's doing. I've learned you cannot go to God with a problem and say, God, here's my problem because the Bible says cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And then when you bring your problem to God and you're supposed to leave it there and walk away and then you try and work out how God's going to do it. Or you try and work out even the best way that God can do it. You've got to let it go and you've got to trust him. You've got to let it go, and you've got to just keep saying, thank you, God, you've got to sort it out. Thank you, God, there's no, there's no problem, there's no temptation, there's no trial. That's uncommon to man, that without it, you will give the man a way of escape. you find that scripture in Corinthians, in Jesus' name. So we have to be in close relationship with him, not that we, so that we can work out what he's doing, but so that we can trust him. We can trust him with our problems. Because if God's promised a solution yes. to it, if God has said, yes. give, and it will be yes. given to you, right. good measure, Die pressed away. down, shaken Die together, away. and running over. Yeah. If God said, yes. I will meet all your needs yes. according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If God has said in his word that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If God has said all those things, then he will do it in Jesus' name. And you've got to get to that position where you can let go and you can trust God. The boat was being tossed in the storm, up and down, up and down. And the disciples, they began to fear and they began to panic. And they saw an app, what they thought was an apparition, and it was Jesus. And he's walking on the water in the storm, coming towards them in the boat. And the disciples, they said, is it a ghost? Is it a ghost? And Peter shouted out, who are you? And Jesus said, it's I. Don't be afraid. And Peter said, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come to you and I will come. And Jesus said, come. And Peter got down and he got out of the boat in the storm and he started to walk on the water staring at Jesus. <laughs> staring at Jesus then he took his eyes off of Jesus and he looked at the storm what storm are you going through what storm are you going through are you going to look at Jesus or are you going to continually look at the storm I can tell you now look at Jesus and he would say come and you walk right through that storm he was in the boat with them on another occasion in a storm and they were, he was fast asleep in the boat, in the storm. They were panicking. Wake up, master. Don't you care that we're going to perish? And what was the first words that came out of Jesus' mouth? Oh, you of little faith. 
You see, we've got to have enough faith that God will meet my needs. That I will get the bond paid. That I will get the rent paid. That I will get the medical aid paid. That I will get the school or whatever it is that you're going to have to pay. Thank goodness we're past the school stage. But you will get it paid in Jesus' name. Because the Bible says, if you are a tither, yes, God will meet all your right. needs. Amen. In Jesus' Amen. name. The devourer, he will bind him up in the name That's of right. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you've got to realize, like I've told you, I think today, but certainly recently, you have to realize that when you want God to do something, He is probably working in someone else's life that's also involved in that problem. And He wants to teach them something, and He wants to bring them to a position of acceptability so that He can now deal with your situation. But if you take your situation to God, God will never let it go until it's been sorted out in Jesus' name. You need to know that... Well, one thing you need to know is that God has a lot of patience. God has got a lot of patience. And God sees the whole picture. You know, one question I'm going to ask the Lord when I get to heaven... I've prayed for many people, usually with Lee, I've prayed for many people that were dying and they got healed. But I've also prayed for many people that have continued to die and they've gone on to be with the Lord. We've led many people on their deathbed to the Lord. We've baptized people on their deathbed. And then they've gone on to be with the Lord. And the one question I want to ask the Lord one day is, what about that person we brought back from death to life? Yes. How come you allowed us to bring somebody yes. back to life yes. and yet when somebody was alive and they were facing death and we prayed for them and we declared that you would change a death situation around into a life situation, they still died. That's one question I will ask him. But I do know this, that the death of God's saints is very precious in his eyes according to his word and we have to understand that we only see life here on earth we see only in this realm in this, this in this I can't think of the word there but in this realm we only see the earth part of it while we're alive we don't see what is further on we can read about it we can read about streets of gold and a river running through and trees clapping their hands and things like that we can read all these things in the bible but to be honest with you it's so great that we can't even imagine it i can't imagine walking on streets of gold i can't imagine the trees of the field clapping their hands I can't imagine these things, but I can trust God that they're truth, because God sees those things. Jesus said, don't be frightened, don't fear. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you it wasn't like that. That's what Jesus promises us. He would have told us if it wasn't like that, but instead he's telling us. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me and God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. There was a lady who used to come to this church. I don't know where they live now. And her mother was getting quite old. And her mother insisted on living in part of the house where they stayed. And, and that part of the house was to be her part of the house. And she said to me, when her mother passed on, she said to me, you know, for the last few days of her life, I saw my mother and she would get up out of her chair and she would go to the door and she would talk to somebody. And when I would look, I couldn't see anybody there. And she said, do you think that was an angel? Now understand this, we don't have a time for a theological teaching, but when the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, speaks about the angel of the Lord, 
It's speaking about Jesus. And I said, yes, that was probably the angel of the Lord who's come back to take him with her to the place in his father's house where he has prepared a mansion for her. And we have to believe these things. God can see these things. God can see exactly what is going to happen when you and I leave this earth. He sees the full picture. He also knows every bit about your future. And it can be, maybe, it's better for God if you go and be with him. And maybe he allows that to happen. You know, I often think about the wild dog attacking one of my children or my grandchildren in the neighbor's yard. I'm going to go rushing across her and grab one of my grandchildren and say, no, you come home with Gramps and be with me where it's safe. I'm just talking nonsense now, what goes on in my mind, but I'm just telling you that that's how God sees things and we have to have this trust of God. Trust of God, not trust of self. Not trust of your wife or your husband. Not trust of your mother or your father. But you do trust them while they're bringing you up. While they're nurturing you into adulthood. Where you'll be then released to go into the world. To face the world on your own. But God doesn't want you to face the world on your own. God wants you to face the world with him. In Jesus name. And God has got a lot of patience. God has got a lot of patience. When I see what he took me through, you know, sometimes I have flashbacks. Sometimes I wonder why this happened in my life and that happened in my life. And I try and analyze it. So, Well, not so much these days, but when I was first born again, I used to. And, uh, and I can see where God's not me this way and not me that way and not me this way and not me and he's still doing it even today knocking me like this to try and get me lining me up for the pearly gates so that he can just give me one good kick <laughs> and I'll go flying through the pearly gates <laughs> we're all going up in the rapture together I knew Praise you were going to say that <laughs> hallelujah Jesus not one go will go before his appointed time amen amen amen, amen. 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 So you can see, and when I see how God, there's some of the things he had to deal with with me, I can see how patient he is. Mm. How patient God is. Maybe you are an immature Christian. Let me rather, instead of using that word immature, because some people take offense to it, maybe you are a maturing Christian, a growing Christian, but you're still down here. You haven't grown that much yet. Christian who expects God to do something when you snap your fingers. Do I have people here that expect God to do something when you snap your fingers? God, I need it now. God, do this. God, do that. I used to be like that. But I've learned. Oh, let me read you this scripture. One of my most favorite scriptures that I read to people when they're really struggling in their health. But it applies to us all every time. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 40, I think it is. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of all the ends of the earth. He neither faints nor he's weary. Yeah. Never gets tired. Yeah. His understanding is unsearchable. You'll never get to the end of God's understanding. His foolishness only begins where our wisdom ends. The Bible says. Verse 20. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might. He increases their strength. So if you're feeling weak. If you're feeling like you've got no might, yeah. just thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, you increase my strength. Even the youths mm -hmm. shall faint and be weary. Mm -hmm. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When you wait on the Lord. We must excuse me, learn to wait on the Lord. We have to realize we must wait on 
the Lord. There's too many preachers that are praying today. God heal him now. God do this for him now. God do that. Who do you think you are to order God around? You can declare it. You can declare it. If you look at the original word there about receiving when you ask God for something, it's uh, well, if you look at the word Greek word there for asking, it literally means demand. But it's a respectful demand. It's a demanding because it is your right, because God has promised it to you. But if you've been keeping your promises to God, We have to learn to wait on God. And God can do things instantaneously. I was in a meeting. There are television cameras there. And there was 10 people in wheelchairs. And that pastor was praying for the people. And he was commanding them to come out of their seats. And all the rest of it. And the camera was there. And of course, the, the, the television channel, they were making a meal of it. How these people were still sat in their chairs. But in the auditorium was full. And I was there with my friend. And we were there watching all this. And there was a guy from Pretoria who came in, he couldn't walk. He would put his walking sticks like that, and then he would swing both legs through the walking sticks. Do you understand what I mean? And he came and he was like that. And this pastor, before he prayed for these people in the wheelchair, he prayed a mass prayer for everybody in the audience, in the congregation, for them to be healed. And he said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And the next thing is, I saw these two crutches flying across and I heard the people gasping and I saw this guy and he was running around I had a lump in my mouth a growth in my mouth and my tongue could feel it all the time and I was there and I was praying and I said God take this away it's so uncomfortable but it was still there I went home I got home and I was feeling it God take it away I don't want it and I went to bed, I went to sleep, and when I woke up the next morning, it was just gone. Just like that. I, I went through a season where I suffered from hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids can be burning, hemorrhoids can be itching, hemorrhoids can be a terrible thing. And uh, I worked with a guy who had the same sort of problem, and he went into hospital, and he had an operation, and he said, you don't ever want to have that operation. And now I became born again. And one day I asked, I think I asked you, yeah, I asked Lee to lay hands on me. And if any of you know, without getting uh, too basic and too uh, thing, hemorrhoids are piles and they affect your anus. They're inside your backside. And so my poor wife, she had to lay her hands on my backside and command those uh, uh, um, hemorrhoids to leave my body. And they left it. Oh, we still laughed about it. We right? still laughed about Christ it. Christ God, hallelujah. They were gone instantly. So there is a time when you can demand or ask God, and it's done immediately. But there is also a time when there is a healing that takes place. There is a time when there is a healing that takes place in Jesus' name. In Mark chapter 16, it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. We've done that many times. Mm, yeah. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and it doesn't say they will be instantly healed. It says, and they will recover. There's a difference between healing and a difference between recovery. Recovery is over a period of time. So we've got to learn that we have to wait on God. I'm going to finish with this. The world... They will only believe it when they actually see it. When they actually see it. Listen to what the discourse that took place between Jesus and Doubting Thomas. Jesus had appeared before the disciples. 
And Thomas was absent at that time. And then when he joined them, they told him, Jesus was here. Jesus appeared to us. He's fine. And Thomas said, I don't believe it. Only when I see it will I believe it. Then all of a sudden, Jesus appears in the room. Then walk through the door, just appears in the room. And Jesus said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands and reach your hand in here and put it into my side. Then he says this, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and he said to him, my Lord and my God. He knew it was his Lord and his God because he felt the wound. He felt the nail holes in the hand. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So what we've got to understand is this in summary. That with the world, they want to first see it before they'll believe it. So you can have a discussion, you can come up against somebody in the world, and they want to first see it before they will believe it. But as a believer, we must believe it and keep on believing it, then we will see it, and then we can produce the evidence to the world. What a time that is, when you produce evidence to the world of something that God has done, how you can witness for God to that unbelieving soul in Jesus, Jesus mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 Now we come to the time of communion. Praise the Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Just close your eyes. Hold up the bread. Just close your eyes and just imagine you're there at the table with Jesus. Jesus stands up. He holds the bread up high. This is my body. Whenever you, which is broken for you, whenever you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. I believe truly, I really believe this, that when we eat this bread, we are consuming, consuming the healing that he purchased for us. And we are healed. We are healed. Let's eat together. And he held up the cup. <clears throat> he held up the cup and he said, this cup is a new cup, the cup of, of grace. And he said, whenever you drink from it, do it in remembrance of me. What, what does he mean? Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. Do it in remembrance of his grace. Do it in remembrance that we should be going to the cross. That we should be dying for our sin. Because Romans chapter 6 tells us. The wages of sin is death. But he went to the cross in our place. And he was crucified in our place. He was buried. And he was resurrected. And we shall also be buried and resurrected. One day. Unless of course we're raptured. In Jesus name. All because of the power of the blood of Jesus. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. precious person in this book before you. Father, we also bring Leon before you. We bring Bridget. Father, we bring the two Macy's before you, Father God. Father, we curse cancer right now in Jesus' name. 
we thank you, Lord, and we bring uh, yes. Pastor yes. Bethwell before you as well, Lord. Yes, amen. Father, we ask you to protect him, Father, wherever yes, he is. Amen. Keep amen. him safe and bring him back home safely. Yes, in, in Jesus', Jesus mighty name, name Father. Bless, Bless Pastor you. Lindy and her children yes. and keep them safe while he's away as in well, Jesus Father. Name. We thank you, Lord, for each and every precious person in this place that you put your angels around, protecting them against yes. all form of incidents and calamity, Father. Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over each and every Amen. single one, Lord Amen. God, each and every single precious person that's got that's cried out to you, Father. You've heard the cries of their heart, Lord. You will deliver, restore, renew them. You will yes. provide for them. You'll give them the desire of their heart, Father, in, in Jesus', Jesus mighty name. In Jesus name. We thank you, Lord. Yes, Father, every precious person that ties and gives, Father, we pray a hundredfold return on every precious person in Jesus' name. Father, they can expect a hundredfold return in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you, Lord. It's good measure. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men pour back into their bosoms. Thank you. And we include it well, Father. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 The Lord bless and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you and give you peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Go out this week with expectancy in your heart that God's going to hear the cries of your heart in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that the new doors are opening up for Amen. certain people here, Father. And we just thank you, Lord God, Amen. in Jesus' mighty Jesus name. Mighty name. In Jesus' mighty Amen. name. Hallelujah.